Okay, number 21. A rubber band, when stretched, exerts a Hooke's Law force back toward its unstretched position. If you pull with a 0 .100 Newton force, you can stretch it 7.5 centimeters. What's the force constant of the rubber band? Okay, so it's like we have a rubber band, and let's say that's what it looks like normally, but we're stretching it. by 7.5 centimeters. And we want to know what the K is, the spring constant, or it doesn't make sense to call it a spring constant here because it's not a spring, but a fo the force constant K of the rubber band. But it is a Hooke's Law force, so it acts like a spring, and spring force is minus Kx. So the idea is we put uh, a coordinate system on, we call it X, we put the relaxed spot, we call that zero, and stretching is in the positive direction. So that's 7.5 centimeters. And the spring force is in the opposite direction, so negative, so pushing back this, or I guess pulling back this way. Um, yeah, so we're at this point where right here we are um, pulling it this way, that's our force of 0 0.100 newtons, but then it's wanting to go back this way with its spring force, or, you know, rubber band force. Um, and we've, we're have we sort of pulling, as, with this amount of force, we've pulled it as far as we can. We can't pull it any further without pulling harder. So we're kind of, we're, we're not moving. This is as far as it goes. It's not moving. So these two forces must be canceling each other out perfectly right at this point. 0.100 newtons going this way, and this must be 0.100 newtons going the other way. In other words, F minus Fs must equal uh, 0. So F minus Kx must equal 0. So uh, we wanted to solve for K. So Kx equals F, and so K, whoops, K equals f over uh, x, sorry, f over x, right. So our, our force of 0 0.100 newtons divided by the 7.5 centimeters, that's really 0 0.075 meters, by the way. Okay, so yeah, so uh, 0.100 newtons, so we go to our calculators, 0 0.100 divided by 0 0.075, and we get one point three and this is this is actually two significant figures so I'll stop there. One point three newtons over meters. So one point three newton meters is the force constant for this rubber band. Okay. Twenty two. A two and a half kilogram object is attached to a spring with a spring constant much bigger this time, 155 newtons per meter. At one moment the spring is compressed so and that's to the left by one centimeter while a force of 0 0.250 newtons pushes it in further further to the left. What is the magnitude and direction of the acceleration? Okay, so drawing a picture, we have the object. Now let's say when, when nobody nothing is pushing on it, this would have gone to like here. This the relaxed spring would have had the object right here. So that's our zero spot in our x on our x-axis. But this thing has been pushed in by one centimeter. So it's at negative 1.00 centimeters, because it's going to the left by one centimeter. And our free body diagram, I'll, which I'll well I'll put it right here. So the spring force is pushing back, but we are pushing to the left. I'll just call that F. That's the 0 0.250 newtons. So we're pushing this way. Spring force is pushing back. We are not assuming that these cancel each other. In fact, we're asked for the acceleration. So presumably, these aren't canceling each other out. And it's going to go one way or the other. Either it's going to go back this way because we're not pushing hard enough, or we're pushing more than enough and it's going to actually accelerate this way. So we have uh, the spring force minus our force equals ma. So the spring force um, is k times x. By the way, it's negative kx. The negative means 
uh, well, no, I'm sorry, it is negative kx. <laughs> that is, that's the right thing to put in there. Minus f equals ma. So a will be negative kx minus f over m. Now, so this will be minus, we've got the 155 newtons per meter, and we've got the x of negative one centimeter, so negative 0 0.0100 meters, minus our force of 0 0.250 newtons, all over the mass of 2.50 kilograms. And so we get an acceleration of, so we go to our calculators, we have, uh, let's see, negative 155 times negative 0.0100, minus 0.25 all divided by 2.5 and we get plus 0 0.52 that's an acceleration so that's zero, uh, point that's meters per second squared positive 0.52 meters per second squared so that's the magnitude first of all and the, it's, it's a one-dimensional problem the positive indicates the direction it is to the right so it will accelerate to the right. So we're pushing, but we're not pushing hard enough to prevent the spring from pushing back. We're just slowing it down. It would be accelerating more if we weren't pushing. But uh, this is the acceleration with us pushing against it. All right. A box slides down an inclined plane. There is friction between the box and the inclined plane. First, we're asked to draw a free body diagram. Notice there are no numbers here. So I'll just draw the actual object on an inclined plane. So the free body diagram is gravity, normal force, and friction. And we're told it's sliding. I guess it doesn't matter, but we're, it's sliding. So that is kinetic friction going back this way. So three forces. OK. For each force, state what the reaction force is. So Newton's third law says every force, for every force there is an equal and opposite reaction. So we can do gravity first. Gravity is uh, from the Earth on the box. So the reaction force is from the box on the Earth. And is, it is gravitational in nature also. Um, and it is just as strong. It's just something we never think about or notice because the Earth is so big that that really, that, that force doesn't do much and it certainly doesn't cause any measurable acceleration on the Earth. Okay, we have the normal force. Now the normal force is from the ramp on the box. Notice all these forces are all going to be on the box. That's why we drew them, because they were all the forces that were acting on the box. It was a free body diagram for the box. So these are all on the box. It's just a question of where they're coming from. Okay, so that means there must be a force from the box onto the ramp pushing down, well, diagonally downward onto it. So from the box on the ramp. Okay. And finally we have friction. Now friction also is from the ramp, right? And once again on the box. Really there's there's two forces from the ramp, the the normal force, the supporting normal force, and then the friction. One's going perpendicular, the other one's going parallel. Um, and so the reactive, the reaction force for friction will also be friction uh, on the surface uh, of the ramp. So from the box on the ramp. So um, reaction forces confuse a lot of people sometimes, but it's real easy if you just concentrate on your whatever force you're talking about. What it's where it's coming from and what it's acting on, the reaction force is always just flip-flopping those. Okay, 
Um, yeah, so that's those are the re, those are the action reaction pairs, three of them. These three are acting on the on the box. They showed up in the free body diagram. These three don't, right? This one would show up if we were doing a free body diagram of the Earth, and these two would show up if we were doing a free body diagram of the ramp, which we could have done, but we didn't. All right. A girl of mass 50 kilograms jumps out of a 250 kilogram canoe that is initially at rest. If her velocity is 7.5 meters per second to the right, what is the velocity of the canoe immediately after she jumps? Okay. So we've got the canoe and we've got the girl. And she's going to jump. Oh, she's jumping to the right. Sorry. She's over here. She's going to jump this way. Um, but actually, what I should do is uh, not draw that yet. So th this is the before picture, right? And then the after picture is she's going this way. She just jumped out. Um, and what you want to realize, well, it's asking what is the velocity of the canoe. You, what you want to realize is the canoe is going to push back this, get pushed back this way. And this is, um, I hope you can recognize, this is a conservation of momentum type problem. We have a before and an after. We know all the velocities before, and we know all but one of the velocities afterward. So we can figure this out using conservation of momentum. Um, Horizontally, this is an this is sort of an isolated uh, this is sort of an isolated system. Um, there is water, and there is going to going eventually to be force between the canoe and the water, sort of friction, sort of drag force actually. It's drag force um, when you're moving through a fluid. But right immediately after the jump, right right as this thing gets started. Um, Remember that drag force only uh, drag force depends on your speed. So uh, there is no drag force until you have speed. And since we're starting with zero speed, initially at rest, then right at the the right before and right after moments of jumping, there kind of is no drag force yet. Now once this thing starts moving, okay, then the drag force will kick in, and this the canoe will slow down, of course. But immediately after the jump, that hasn't happened yet. So we can apply conservation of momentum and assume it's a uh, horizontally and isolated system. So anyway, we have initial momentum equals final momentum. Everything is at rest over here, so that's zero. Over here, we have mass of girl, velocity of girl, mass of canoe, velocity of canoe. We have this, this, and this. We don't have this. We solve for it. So a little bit of algebra. You bring this term over. You divide by the mc. OK. So we plug everything in. So it will be negative uh, mass of girl 50 times velocity of girl 7.5, which by the way is positive because it's to the right, divided by mass of canoe, which is 250. And so we get negative 1.5. That is a meters per second. That is a velocity. And it is negative, which means it's to the left. So the velocity of the canoe is 1.5 meters per second to the left. That's what the canoe will do when she jumps out. All right. 25. A model train car of mass 250 grams traveling with a speed of 0.50 meters per second couples to, that means attaches to, another car of mass 400 grams that is initially at rest. What is the speed of the cars after they have coupled together? Oops. Uh, there we go. And there we go. All right. So again, if this feels like another conservation of momentum type problem, it is. So we have This guy's moving to the right, and we have the one that's at rest. That's the before picture. The after picture is 
they're linked to each other. Right? And I guess they'd be moving to the right after they link together. And the question is how fast are they going? So again, initial momentum equals final momentum because of conservation of momentum. Um, yeah, and it's an isolated system horizontally. Nothing on the outside is affecting them. There's a little bit of friction, but we're assuming because it's rolling, it's uh, very little friction, negligible. Uh, so yeah, we can treat it as an isolated system. All right, so we don't have in zero initial momentum, in fact. So let's call this car A and car, this will be car B. So we have um, mass of A times velocity of A. Now B has zero momentum because it has zero velocity. And now this is interesting. Afterward, they actually attach. So they're kind of one object now. I'll call that AB, right? So like now it's... Well, I, I guess I don't have to even go there. I can just, the thing is, they're connected, so they're moving at the same speed. So mass of A times, I'll just call it final velocity, plus mass of B times final velocity. Um, I want to use the same symbol, the same variable for both of their velocities. We don't know it, but I don't want to pretend like they're two different ones, because they're not. And that's good, because we have to solve for it. So this is like MA plus MB times, all times VF. And over here we have MAVA. All right, so when you solve for VF, I get MAVA divided by that parentheses. All right, and then we plug everything in. So uh, 0.250, 250 grams, right? 0.250 kilograms times speed of 0.50 positive divided by uh, the 0 0.250 plus the 0 0.400 kilograms. And this gives me positive which we knew it should be, 0 0.19 meters per second. So the two of them together will be traveling that fast. Okay. A two and a half kilogram block is initially at rest on a frictionless surface. A force of, oh, what was that? I've lost what that was. Oh, just 0 0.50 newtons, okay. Uh, to the right is applied to the block for three and a half seconds. What is the velocity of the block afterward? All right, so uh, so, okay. the object moving this way. Um, we have a force and we're told how long it's being applied. This should immediately put you in the frames in the frame of mind of thinking about impulse, right? Impulse is a force that lasts for a, an amount of time and the impulse is multiplying them together. Okay, so that's what you want to be thinking about immediately here. I think that's the way to go. So um, the impulse momentum theorem says that the net impulse equals the change in momentum. Now the net impulse is the net force divided by the, uh, excuse me, times the time. And we have that, right? We have a constant force and a time. We can just multiply them. Um, in fact, let's do that right now. So 0 0.50 newtons times 3.5 seconds is 1.75 newton seconds. And that equals change in momentum. So that's the mass times the final velocity minus the mass times the initial velocity, right? Final momentum minus initial momentum. That's the change in momentum. Uh, this guy is zero. It started at rest. And so it's actually just equal to MVF 
So we can take VF, we can just take the 1.75 newton seconds, and we can divide by the mass, which is 2.5 kilograms, and we get 0 0.70 meters per second. So we totally bypassed acceleration by using impulse momentum. Okay. 27. The force that is applied to a 10.6 kilogram object is always to the right, but its magnitude is not constant. The graph of the magnitude of the force is shown. So we can see it. It ramped up over the first two seconds, then it was a, a constant for two more seconds, and then it went back down to zero over the next four seconds. We do not, notice we do not actually know this number where it, where it peaked right here. That's called F max. And so the object starts at rest and by the end of the eight seconds of applied force it is traveling at 12.3 meters per second. Find F max. Alright, so again we have force and time. This is impulse. So we have impulse equals change in momentum. But unlike the previous problem where we had the imp we could figure out the impulse and then it was uh, we were, the unknown was with the momentum side, I think we have the momentum side or we, we can figure it out and see the unknown thing is in the force so it's part of the impulse. So it's just running the problem the other way. The impulse, uh, let's do the change in momentum first I guess. Uh, it starts at rest, right, so it's MVF minus MVI, but that's zero. So it's just MVF. We have the mass, we have the uh, final velocity. So we have both of those. Now the impulse, uh, this isn't as easy as F times delta T, because that's, that's when you have constant force. We have this graph, but impulse is the integral of force times dt when it's not constant and from a graph that just means the area and we can figure that out using geometry. So let's see, so this is a triangle, its height is f max, its base is 2, so it's 1 half times 2 times f max. 1 half times 2 times f max. So it'll be f max. Okay, then we have a rectangle which is 2 by f max, so 2 f max. And then we have another triangle which is 4, so 1 half times 4 times f max, so 2 f max. So all in all we have 5 f max, I think. That's, that's the area under this trapezoid. Okay equals MVF. So I can divide by 5 and that'll give me F max. So M 10.6 times VF which is 12.3 and then we divide by 5 I'm getting 26. Uh, this is a three significant problem, figure problem, so 26.1 actually. 26.1 newtons. That's what this maximum force is. It ramps up to 26.1, stays at 26.1, and then scales back down to zero after eight seconds. All right, last problem. A ping pong ball has a mass of 2.7 grams. It approaches a player at 13 meters per second. The player hits it with her paddle in the opposite direction with a varying force that is 54 newtons on average. The paddle is in contact with the ball for 0 0.013 seconds. What is the speed of the ball after it is hit? Okay, so um, once again we have time and force. Once again we want to think about impulse and its relationship to momentum. Um, so we know that the impulse equals the change in momentum. I think we can figure out the impulse. We don't have a constant force, but we know what it is on average, so that's just as good for the purposes of this, right? It's average force times time, good enough. 
um, I could plug those in now if I wanted to. Um, I'll wait for just a second. The change in momentum. Uh, let's assume the ball was going, I don't know, to the left at first. Here's the paddle. <laughs> and then it hits it, and now the ball is going to the right. So this change in direction is important because one of these velocities has to be negative. Let's say to the right is positive. So that means this initial velocity is actually negative. This 13 meters per second should go in as a negative. So, by the way, I can factor out the m here. Um, and I'm solving for vf, so I divide by m. And then I add the vi, and that equals vf, right? If I do my algebra like that. So, um, yeah, so I've got the 54 newtons times the 0.013 seconds divided by 2.7 grams, 0027 kilograms. And then I have to add vi, but remember that that's going in as negative, so minus 13 meters per second. OK, and I'm running out of room here, so I'll put the answer here. I go to my calculator, 54 times 0 0.013 divided by 0 0.0027 minus 13 is 200, positive 247 meters per second. Uh, the number might be a little unrealistic here. Um, one of these one of these numbers probably was not very realistic because we were really slamming the ball back the other way <laughs> really fast but okay so 247 meters per second to the right that's the speed okay uh, just again I want to emphasize um, sometimes students uh, have trouble recognizing the kinds of problems where you want to go into impulse and momentum and um, uh, hopefully these these types of problems are giving you a little bit of practice of spotting that. Um, again, it's when you have a force that lasts for a time that often, I would even say usually, means you can use I equals delta P. Okay. All right.